Everybody say Palm Sunday. They hailed him as he rode in. They hollered, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. They threw palm leaves and they threw their garments for him to ride in over the top. Everyone say profound faith that turned into fickle faith because a week later these same people are crying out, crucify him, away with him. I want to know that my faith will stand the test of time amen so if my faith is in me i'm in trouble if my faith is in you i'm in trouble you say what do you mean you're in trouble well how many of you've ever messed up see i'm in trouble <laughs> but if my faith is in him he's a solid rock Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles today, I want you to go with me to John chapter 20, starting with verse 1. John chapter 20, starting with verse 1. By the way, just as a reminder to everyone that the chosen uh, that are meeting here Wednesday, that is for youth only. Ad adults are not allowed in that meeting unless Kat has asked you to come in and Sir, we've just had some questions about that, and I just want to make sure because, well, you, Pastor, why are you doing that? Because teenagers won't open up if there's a bunch of adults around. So we, we want to give them the opportunity to be able to worship God. Okay? Now, John 20, starting with verse 1 and 2. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word that's life. We just ask you to speak to us today, God, through it. Help us, God, to be able to open our hearts to you and to be respond with our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody say it with me. Amen. Amen. I want to speak to you for just a little while today on the napkin is folded. Would you say that with me? The napkin is folded. Everybody hold, hold, your, hold yours up. Don't do anything with it yet. Just hold it up. I, I started looking at this, and let's take a look at what happens. Mary goes to the tomb on the third day she's going to not look for a resurrected savior she's going there to put warm oil on a cold body she's going to bring incense and finish the job of the ritual of burial and as she's going there it's still dark outside so love is driving her there you know nobody wants to hang out in a cemetery at night she's going while it's still dark but it had been dark for mary ever since friday when she gets there what she discovers is a stone rolled off of the tomb and she looks down and the tomb's empty i want to ask you a question why doesn't she start shouting he's alive he's alive he's alive she heard him say it she was there when he told the disciples you destroy this temple and in three days I'll, or when he told the pharisees you destroy this temple in three days i'll raise it up he she heard him tell the disciples that the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners but on the third day he will rise she had heard it over and over so why didn't she get it it's because of what she saw last how many of you have ever seen anything that just had a, I mean, that, you know, just kind of a, had such an impact on you, it just made a, a, a memory in your mind? You know what I'm talking about? She watched him suffer. She watched him 
go through a horrendous beating. I think sometimes what happens is we just read about Calvary or, or we, you know, years ago, I, I, I was on the evangelistic field for years, and I used to, every place I'd go, if I preach about Calvary, I'd always make this statement, and this, before, this was before the passion had ever been produced. And I always made the statement, I said, if Hollywood ever produces a movie that shows what Calvary was really like, it'll have to be rated R. I said, because it was a bloody mess. And then when the passion came out, I got a phone call from a pastor, and he said, you're right, you're right. Do you understand what he went through that day? In a book that Lee Strobel wrote called The Case for Easter, he went and he interviewed medical, uh, or, or he, he interviewed professionals in the field of the study of Roman crucifixion. And he talked about what took place there that day. He described something to them, or to Lee, that he said, man, made me just squirm in my chair. He said the Roman whip that beat him was thongs of leather that was braided together, and it was woven in with lead balls and pieces of bone so that when they hit you with it, the lead would lay a deep bruise on you, and the bone would rip the flesh off of your back. They said it wasn't limited to just the back. They would beat the back, his back. They would beat the legs. And they said often people died from the beating before they ever got to Calvary. He said that during a study of this, they found that through the, the examining people that had been crucified and been beaten, they found out that when they beat these people, oftentimes it exposed their spinal cord. In a book called The Anatomy of Calvary, they wrote and said that if you had shown a bright light at Jesus' chest after that beating, you could have seen the rays of that light shining through his back. When they beat him and ripped him, it tore the skeletal muscles and that would end up producing ribbons of bloody flesh that would be just hanging and quivering. Isaiah said his image was marred more than any man. When Mary saw him last, he was unrecognizable. That's what she remembered. That's what's embedded in her mind. She watched seven-inch spikes rip through his wrists. I said, Pastor, I thought it said hands. That Jesus' day, the wrist was considered part of the hand. He had to carry a 75-pound beam on his back to Golgotha. Can you imagine being ripped open like that? Your spine exposed and trying to carry a beam no wonder he fell under the load. No wonder they had to grab a man named Simon and have him finish carrying the cross. When they got him to the place called the skull, they took those spikes and put through his wrists. There's a nerve there called the median nerve. And just, look, if it's not enough pain to have a spike go through your wrist, it crushed that nerve. You've got another nerve that's like it, and it's in your elbow. We call it the funny bone. When we hit it, how many of you have ever hit that? You just bump it. Yeah, and it ain't funny. I thought, why do they call that the funny bone? Man, you just barely bump that, and you've got pain going through you. Imagine that, 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 that same type of pain if that nerve is not bumped, but it's in a pair of vice grips being twisted and torn. That's what he was experiencing. They hoisted him up, and when they hoisted him up to fasten him to that vertical beam, it is pulling his arms apart. The whole weight of his body is on those wrists. It, they said it stretched his arms immediately about six inches. It dislocated his shoulders. That's why in the psalmist he makes the statement, and he said, my body is out of joint she saw that 
It's seared in her mind. A spear piercing his side. Him crying out, it is finished. And dropping his head. That's why she's not thinking about a resurrection. Because she saw an excruciating death. Do you understand that Calvary, crucifixion, was such a horrendous, painful event that they had to create a word to describe it? The word is excruciating. It literally means out of the cross. The pain was so tremendous. It was, they didn't have a word. So they called it excruciating. That's why when she looks in and it's empty, the first thing that hits her mind isn't that he's alive, it's somebody stole his body. She's so broken and shaken that she runs to Peter and John to where they're at, and she runs in, and she says, they've taken away the Lord's body, and I don't know where they've laid him. And when Peter and John hear that, all of a sudden, look at these two together. The disciple that Jesus loved with the disciple that denied he existed, (laughs) denied he had been with him. Is that not weird? Is that not strange? No, it's really not when you think about it. When Peter last saw Jesus, it was when he was denying him for the third time. And he ran away and cried. He never had the opportunity to say, I'm sorry. He never had the he never got the chance to go back and say, please forgive me. What do you think it was like for him to lay his head on a pillow at night and try and find sleep? There was none. And if he couldn't be with Jesus, at least he wanted to be with the one that he loved, so he's with John. And John is trying to assure Peter he hasn't forgotten you. When he finds out that he's gone, that someone's taken his body, he takes off, and they both take off running to that tomb. As they run toward the tomb, John outruns Peter. I don't know if he's a better athlete or if the love that he has for God is just pushing him forward. But when he gets there, he stops because it seems like his heart would break to go in. This is as far as I can go. And he stooped down and he looked in and he saw the linen clothes. But when Peter got there, Peter's mind must be thinking, I failed him in life. I'm not going to fail him in death. And he boldly breaks into that tomb. Where are they? I'll take on the whole Roman army right now. They're not going to do this. I promise you, I'm not going to fail you again. And when he bursts into that tomb, he sees those linen clothes lying. And then there's something that is said in John that always stuck with me. I, look at this. This is in the, sixth, the 20th chapter, starting with verse 6. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher and saw and believed. That always puzzled me. I could never figure that out. Why is John so meticulous in his description of the napkin? He doesn't say, well, yeah, we went in and th- there were the linen clothes there, there or the grave clothes there. Yeah, they were there. He, he, he makes sure that he lets us know that o- not only is the napkin not with them, but the napkin is folded. Who cares if it's folded? The napkin is folded and it's laid in a place by itself. 
That scripture puzzled me for years. I searched commentaries, I searched history, trying to find something about what is going on in that scene. There's got to be something to that. Why is John pointing that out? And a little over 30 years ago, I was taking a tour, and it was a a Jewish man that was leading it. And he began to describe something to me about a tradition that was in his family. And he said for as long as he could remember and as long as his mother and grandmother could remember, as far back as they could remember, this tradition existed among them. And it concerned a napkin. He said when we went to someone's home to eat a meal, no matter what they served us, if we had enjoyed being in their presence, even it it, it didn't matter if it was fried chicken or if it was spaghetti. He said, we wouldn't wouldn't use the napkin to wipe our mouth. We'd get up if we had to and, and, and go to the restroom and wash our hands and wash our face, but we would not use the napkin. I'm thinking, why? He said, because what we would do He said, we would take that napkin and we would fold it. And then we would take it, fold it, and lay it in a place by itself on the table. And I thought, man, that seems like an odd tradition unless you start thinking about other countries' traditions. I mean, if you're in China and you don't belch after a meal, you're considered rude. Here, if you belch after a meal, that erases all doubt that you're rude. (laughs) Right? But not there. If you belch after a meal in China, it means that it was a very good meal, and the cook is very pleased, and the company is very pleased. The family that invited you is pleased. So it's not when you start looking at traditions, traditions carry certain context depending on where it developed. He's a Jew. (laughs) When he started telling me this, and he said, we fold that napkin and set it in a place by itself. I said, why why do you do that? He said, because it lets the company know that we've been pleased to be here and we'll be back. (laughs) When John saw the napkin uh, that had been folded uh, and it was laid by a place in that tomb, uh, it was Jesus making a declaration, I've been pleased to be with you, uh, I'll be back. Now, look, I can't prove that that's what it meant, but you can't prove it wasn't. <laughs> well, I didn't get this off the Internet. This, I got this 30, over 30 years ago from a Jew. And he's telling me this, and, I'm, and I had all my life thought about, what's this mean? And then it was like everything came together. So I don't know if they got their tradition from that napkin being found in the tomb or if Jesus laid hold of a tradition that was already in play and folded the napkin to let us know, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Now, we know what his response was to us. The napkin's folded. In a place by itself, he's been pleased to be with us. He said, I'll I'll be back. But what about our response to him? I thought about others that had sat with him and supped with him. Judas had sat with him. Judas had literally sat across the table from him. Think about that. He has, for three and a half years, he has broke bread with this man. He watched Jesus... Take five loaves and two fish and feed thousands of people. He watched Jesus spit in a man's eyes. Well, he spit in clay and put it in the man's eye. And the man could see again. He was blind. And he went away seeing. He watched Jesus 
raise the dead. But the longer he sits at this table, it seems like the more discontent he becomes with what's being served to him. What are you talking about? Oh, I don't doubt for a moment that Judas believed that Jesus was the Messiah. I think that his actions and him following him proves that. I think that what Judas is dealing with is why isn't he overthrowing this Roman government? Why isn't he establishing the throne of David? That's what this was about. And every time he's trying to, you know, help, encourage him, push him forward. No, that's... So Judas finally decides he needs a little help. I'm going to shove him into it. Maybe I can force his hand. Do you really think that you'd ever be able to force the hand of God. And Judas sets a plan in action. A silent garden, 30 pieces of silver, a band of soldiers should do the trick. He comes out and he kisses him. Master, he looked at him and said, Judas, do you betray me with a kiss? And then it happens. What I think Judas had been waiting for. He steps over and he looks at the soldier and he said, who are you looking for? And they cockily said, Jesus of Nazareth. And as if for one last display. One more time to remind them of the words that they had, he had already spoken to them. No one takes my life. I, I'm going to lay it down. I, I'm going to pick it back up. He looked at those soldiers and he said, I am he. And when he said that, he laid that entire army on the ground. I can't help but think that Judas is going, this is it. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. But they jump back up. They grab him and they begin to beat him. And Judas takes the napkin. This isn't, this isn't what was supposed to happen. I, he was supposed to take control. He's got, why doesn't he, why doesn't he do it? And he throws the silver back at the feet of the priest. But he couldn't undo what he already did. And he went out and he hung himself. I'm not sitting at this table again. Everyone has to make the choice. Everyone has to decide for themselves. There's another man sitting at a table. It's the only man that I'm aware of. Now, now there, there may be someplace else in Scripture, I've, and it may be slipping my mind, but at this moment, it's the only man I'm aware of outside of Jesus, of God bragging about to the devil. <laughs> devil showed up at God's house. So where you been? He said, I've been walking all around looking who I could take out, seeking whom I may devour. God looked him right in the eye and said, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. <laughs> he pushes away evil. He loves me. <laughs> and the devil man winces and he, well, yeah, but you've got a hedge around him. I can't get to him. Lift that hedge. Let me touch him. Let me get to him. And I'll show you, he'll curse you to your face. God doesn't believe it. I don't think Job's love for me is wrapped up in stuff. So he lifts the hedge high enough, or low enough, he pulls it back and allows him. He said, you can touch his stuff, but you can't touch him. Job went from being a Wall Street tycoon <laughs> 
to busted. There's some other folks that happened to back in 1929. Any of you remember that? Stock market crashed and men started jumping out of windows because they said, all I have is gone. Oh, my goodness. If all you have is wrapped up in a stock market, you don't have much. If all you have is measured in a bank account, you don't have much. Job had something inside of him that money could not buy, and he makes it a statement. His wife comes up lovingly, wrapping her arms around him, saying, why don't you curse God and die? Why don't you just get this over with? Man, look at this. We're busted. We ain't got nothing. I can't shop at the big stores anymore. He looked at her and said, you, you, you're talking foolish. You... You speak like a foolish woman. He said, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm not walking off. I'm not giving up. The devil showed back up. He said, have you considered my servant Job, even though I moved and let you touch him? And not you. He said, skin for skin. A man will give everything for his own flesh. Let me touch his flesh, and he'll curse you to your face. He said, you can touch his flesh, but you can't take him out. Job gets covered with boils, pain, suffering. He scraped himself. Teenagers worried about a pimple. Boils, scraped himself. His friends showed up, and his anguish is so great. They just sat there quiet for seven days without saying a word. They couldn't find anything to say. And when they finally spoke, they started accusing him. Well, you surely did something to be going through all this. You need to repent. I figured something was going on in your life. You need to just confess it and get it out. And he looks at him. He said, what are you talking about? I love God. I've held on to God. I've never transgressed against God. I'm not going to start acting like I'm some vile sinner here. I love him. And they start trying to rattle his cage. And with everything that's going on, he doesn't understand it. He doesn't know why he's going through it. He's got no insight to the conversation Satan had with God. All he knows is everything he had is gone and he's in pain that's unbearable. But you know what he does? He stands up, looks at all those that are accusing him, and he gets his napkin out. And he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And he folds it and sets it on a table and says, you know what? I don't care what I'm going through. It doesn't matter what I'm facing. I am not going to walk away away from God. I, I am not throwing in the towel. I'm not giving up. I'm hanging on. Somebody shout it out. Hold on. Don't give up on the brink of a breakthrough. When God saw that response, he, I can't, I know I don't have scripture for this, but God gave me an imagination for something. <laughs> I see God grabbing the devil by the nap of the neck and saying, see everything you did to him? And he wouldn't curse me. And now I'm getting ready to bless him like you ain't never seen before. He gives him seven times more than he ever had. And when he finally showed up, how many of you have ever wanted an answer from God? Wanted an answer. And we, and we felt like we had the answer. As a matter of fact, instead of waiting for the answer from God, we start giving him the answer. Job was there, man. He'd done it. But when God finally showed up, the Bible said that God spoke to him. Man, I had this happen to me. I, I, I was going in, to, I was getting ready to get married. I needed a job bad because you can't get married without a job. Thank God I got an amen back there somewhere. And I, I'm, I'm getting ready to get married. I'm going in for this job, and I'm confident, man. I, I prayed. I'm confident. I go in there, and I said, you hire me, and you won't be disappointed. I said it, folks. I'm just telling you. I was, I, I, I was confident. Said, I, you know, they were looking at me for accounting. You hire me, you won't be disappointed. 
He said, okay, I got your application. They call me the next day. They said, hey. They t- said, it's the name of the company. I walked in there and prayed. This guy. <laughs> Says, Mr. McNeely, yes, it is. We're calling to let you know that you didn't get the job. We hired someone with better qualifications than you. I ain't never got a call from somebody to let me know I didn't get the job. To let me know somebody better showed up. I went in the back bedroom, fell on the bed. There's a pillow on that bed. Man, I was upset. God, how can you do this? And I, I grabbed that pillow and squeezed it real hard. I didn't know there was a baby bottle in that pillow full of oatmeal. When I squeezed it, that oatmeal shot me in the face, man. I'm digging oatmeal out of my eye, and I'm, I'm now I'm, I'm really... <coughs> There's a Bible there, and I grabbed that Bible up. And I'm telling you the truth. I'm confessing my fault right now. I grabbed that Bible, and I, I said, God, you said in your word there's encouragement, and I need it now. And I whipped it open, and, man, it fell open to Job. <laughs> no, no, no. You ain't. It fell open to Job where all of a sudden God spoke to Job and said, Gird yourself up now like a man. I, I will demand of you, and you answer me. Where were you at when I spoke this world into existence? I, can you make the waves stop where they're at? Can you serve Leviathan up to your friends? When I got done reading that, I had the same answer Job did. I abhorred myself and repentance and dust and ashes because I uttered things that were too marvelous for me to understand. I dropped down on my knees and I said, God, I'm sorry. I'm going to serve you no matter what. I love you. You're a good God. I quit blaming God and started thanking God. I quit blaming him and started praising him. And God is my witness. I think it was the next day I got a call back from that company, and I thought, man, what are they doing, calling to rub it in? And they called me back, and they said, hey, we want you to come to work for us as a shipping and receiving clerk. Within, th- within three weeks, I believe it was, three or four weeks of being there, they made me supervisor. God is a God that knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Now, the question is, what about your napkin? Hold it up if you got it. What are you, you going to do with your napkin? Well, pastor, you just don't know what I've had put on my plate. Well, you hadn't taken a look at mine lately either, have you? What are you getting at? I want you to hear me. It's not like... What was on Jesus' plate was tasty. Jesus is in the garden, and he prays this prayer. Lord, let this cup pass from, I don't want to eat what's on my plate. I don't like what I've been served up here. Let it pass from me. How many of us have ever done that? You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about in real life, man. I was a kid. My dad had green peas on my plate. I wasn't touching them. He said, you're not leaving the table until you eat your green peas. I started to contemplate the rest of my life at a kitchen table. I thought, man, I, I'm not touching. I tried to talk brothers and sisters into. To, I said, it wouldn't be that hard if we all participated. They said, I ate mine. You eat yours. Of all things, it had to be on Halloween. He said, no trigger treat until you eat those peas. <laughs> Through the lips and pass the gums. Look out, stomach, here it comes. <laughs> what are you saying? Do, do you understand? We, we forget that Jesus isn't just 100% God. He's 100% human. He doesn't want to die. (laughs) But he says, not my will, but thine be done. What's he do? He folded the napkin. (laughs) Excruciating pain. 
horrendous death. That's what we did to him. And after having gone through that, for him to fold the napkin, the Bible said he came to his own and his own received him not, but God commended his love toward us and that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. He didn't just die. He folded the napkin. He said, I've been pleased to be with you. I'm coming back. I said, he's coming back. The question is, is when he comes back, what's your napkin going to look like? Have you gone through something and said, forget this, if this is what living for God's about? Let me remind you that people fail. God doesn't. I said people fail. Matter of fact, let me, can I cue you into a scripture that sometimes we tend to forget? It said for all, everybody say all, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yeah, but my sin ain't as bad as yours. Really? I didn't know there was a measuring scale for sin. The wages of sin is, but the gift of God. I hadn't always liked what was on my plate. There have been times I prayed about it. There have been times I, I, I was in a meeting, and two men took my wife aside privately and asked her not to play during altar service. And she came back to me and had been crying. I'm not going to play games with you. Those two guys had been in front of me. They would have been crying. I hadn't grown wings, folks. But I had to preach that night. God knows how to set you up, doesn't he? I rode up there in a bus with those people. If I'd have had a car, I would have packed it and left. I didn't have a car. Debbie's trying to tell me, it's okay, it's okay. You know, you go, man, I go into another room and I fall across the bed. I don't like what's just been put on my plate. Every time the Spirit of God would try and move, these folks would try and shut it down. And I said, God, I need some help. I don't like what I see here, but I won't run. Please, God, help me. That night when we got into service, the choir got up and started to sing. All of a sudden, the presence of God started to fall. The leadership stood up and shut them off. <laughs> when that happened, I'd been sitting in a pew. Debbie will testify to this. When he did that, I went like this, and Debbie grabbed my leg, trying to hold me back. This wasn't me anymore. I got what I needed from God. She tried to hold me back. The guy saw me coming, and he immediately said, we're just going to bring the vans and stuff right now, because he knew I was coming, whether he's ready or not. I got up to the front of that place, and I stood up, and I said, you all know what you felt just a moment ago, and I said, you shut it down. I said, I want the choir to stand up right where you're at, in the pew where you're at. I said, don't come up here. I said, I want you to start singing that song again. And all of a sudden, they started singing that song. I felt the power of God start to come down. I started ministering. When I opened it, look, I was doing this with my eyes closed. I didn't want to see what was going on. When I opened my eyes, the altar was packed, and it stayed packed till about 1.30 or 2 o'clock that morning. I, I'm telling you that God is a God that knows what he's doing. Everything on the plate isn't always easy to swallow. But he promised, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll go with you to the end of the world. He already threw it away. <laughs> so that's what I know. I want you to stop and consider right now where you're at, what you're going through, because you're, every one of our walks is unique to us. There aren't any big eyes and little U's in God's house. 
And he loves us each the same. And he's waiting to see what your response will be. Hey, anybody can serve God when everything's going right. What about when there's a bend in the road? What about when all of a sudden your super highway turns into an old, dusty, dirt country road? And you're not sure exactly where you're at anymore. In a moment of desperation, are you going to crinkle it up? Or are you going to do what Job did? And say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Though he slay me, yet I'll trust him. I've been on some plane rides. I don't even know if Debbie knows this. I've been on some airline rides before that literally I got into some bad places and I thought they were going to go down. And I started praying, God, please take care of my family. I wasn't yelling, God, how could you let this happen to me? I'll admit one time I did pray. I said, God, I'm closer to you from where I'm at right now. If this plane's got to go, could I skip that fall and just, you know, go on up? I, I'm not playing with you. I prayed that. I said, I'd rather miss that fall. I don't want to. I'd rather not eat that. But we all have to make the decision. So what I want you to do right now is in light of where you're at, circumstance in your life right now, what's going on in your life right now, I want you to make a decision before God. And if you're willing to say, God, I don't necessarily like what's on my plate, but I'm not about to walk away. So today, God, I want to fold my napkin and let you know that I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to trust you. If, if, if that's your decision, would you, would you fold your napkin right now? Would you do that? Would you just fold it? Once you've done that, if you would, just hold your napkin up. Just hold it up so I can see it. You got it held up high. Hold it way up there. Can I see yours? Let me see yours. Everybody's got those napkins up. Okay, you can put them down. I, I gotta, I'm running into a problem here. You say, well, what's your problem? Well, I, I folded my napkin like that. Somebody folded it like that. I mean, look at that. Somebody, somebody just did one fold. Whew. What? What's the, what's your point? Well, I, I don't know what these folks are going to do. <laughs> Obviously, they can't make it. They didn't fold their napkin like mine. <laughs> oh, come on now. You know what I'm talking about. How many times have we heard that? Oh, we're the only ones going to heaven. Well, I don't know which heaven you're going to, but you may be real alone. We're not folding our napkins for men. We're folding them for God. And you know what God does? God looks in your life, and he sees that, and he said, man, I know what they've been through. <laughs> Look at that napkin. Boy, that's a testimony to they're not going anywhere, that they love me. Uh, he, he made it. He, made, he, he folded that napkin in spite of everything. Oh, look, he got creative with his. He must have really been praying about some stuff. You know, but what he's doing is he's saying, look, they folded their napkin. He said, you know what? I've already folded mine. I, I've already made a statement to you. I, I'm coming back, and I see you're ready for me to to come and get you. So get ready, because ready or not, here I come. <laughs>